I think we're on and we're ready. It's good to see everybody today and uh, excited to get back in our study here in Revelation. Uh, Pastor Tom is out of town, so we're going to not have music. We'll just jump into our study and uh, see how far we get and kind of go from there. But I do want to mention a couple things to you before we jump in. Uh, of course, tonight, our focus groups and classes, we want you to be a part of that. Uh, also, this Saturday is Fish in a Barrel. So if you want to go fishing with us, I can guarantee you're going to catch something uh, that comes from the water. Whether that be small or big, I can't predict, but uh, we have a lot of fun with that. If you want to go to Fish in a Barrel, we're going to be at the church at 2.30, and uh, more information is out there on our summer flyer sheet that should be uh, out there at the kiosk. And then also, don't forget about our church picnic coming up on the 27th, Downs Park. And then, of course, VBS, that's coming up August 22nd through the 24th, and the church picnic on the 27th. So lots of things coming up as summer is flying by, isn't it? You wouldn't know that by the temperature outside, but uh, it's just flying by, and the kids, of course, start school a little bit earlier this year, so all of that's going to be happening in a couple weeks in advance but uh, we're excited about the different things happening here at C3. Uh, Let's pray. And as we do, fish in a barrel. uh, Hmm. Well, um, it's just one of those things, right? Uh, We're glad everyone's paying attention, and uh, we we just want to keep you sharp. Uh, We don't think you need to take Prevagen. We can can do that for you here. We can keep you sharp, so... (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Oh, that's good. A couple prayer requests. Uh, Ronnie Lloyd, some of you know her as Veronica. She has been, uh, she's had numerous physical challenges. Uh, She's in the hospital now. Uh, Her body's retaining fluid due to a a variety of different things happening. Um, I, I did get a report even this morning that she's doing a little bit better, but she's struggling to breathe and it's just a variety of different challenges. She's in Salisbury. Let's pray for her today, and also Debbie Morgan, who's having surgery this morning. Uh, Let's ask the Lord to touch and and minister in that situation, Um, and I'm sure you have different needs uh, that you're carrying, and let's pray for those. God knows exactly which ones and what those things are. Let's ask the Lord to to be with us today and, and to touch these needs. Father, we are thankful for your goodness and your grace. We're thankful for your faithfulness that you continue to show to us each and every day. What a great confidence and peace that you've given to us that we can call upon your name, enter into your presence, and Father, make our needs and our petitions known to you. Father, we're thankful that you already know them in advance, but you invite us to come. Father, how you love our fellowship and how we love yours. Lord, today as we enter into uh, your house and to hear your word, God, allow your word to fall upon our hearts. Let it be fertile ground. Father, we can receive your word and, Father, grow from it. And, Father, we ask that you would touch these various needs, these that we've mentioned, these that we have upon our shoulders and our hearts today. Lord, we ask that you would intervene. We know that you are a God that can intervene, and we pray for that. We pray for that for Ronnie Lloyd for Debbie Morgan, and Father, for various other needs. Uh, God, we just ask that you would hear our hearts today. Intervene in our world, in our nation, in our culture. God, help us to be exactly who you've called us to be, steadfast and consistent, not compromising, but just, Father, rooted in the Word of God. Help us to be all that you've called us to be and accomplish what you've called us to accomplish. Be with us today as we hear your Word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, let's jump in. If you want to open your Bible, and I hope that you received an outline as you came in, we are in the 17th chapter of the book of Revelation. We're nearing the end. We're in Revelation chapter 17, and due to uh, general assembly and vacation and and a variety of different things happening, we, we haven't met in a while in this study. And so let me just give you a quick recap. Uh, We've been through the seven seals. We've been through the seven trumpets. And the last time we met, we studied the 16th chapter of Revelation that has to do with the seven bowls. And this again is really the, the, the turning point of the second part of the tribulation. 
We believe the seals and the trumpets lead us up to that 3.5 years where people are being saved. When we get into this 16th chapter with the seven bowls, we believe that uh, there will be nobody saved in these moments. Uh, sores and boils it was one of the bowls that took place. And these were intense and they were consecutive. And then the sea became uh, like the blood of a dead man, the Bible says. Rivers and springs of fresh water turned to blood. There's no drinking source, water source, that, that's going to be available. The, the sun's heat increases to a degree that man has never experienced before. That was one of the, the, the bowls that was poured out. Darkness and intense agony that men would gnaw upon their tongues. Uh, the Euphrates River drying up. Uh, and then a great storm and an earthquake with huge hail falling from heaven. Those were the seven bowls. And we get here into chapter 17, and we get into chapter 17 and 18. They are two chapters that are kind of difficult to interpret, but we're headed towards the, the, the battle of Megiddo, uh, Armageddon in the battle of Megiddo. And so here's where we're at in, in the timeline. And so let's jump with, with chapter 17 here this morning. And if we were to put a title on this, it's about the great harlot. It's the great harlot. Now, who does this uh, harlot typify? Uh, who is it? Some will say, well, this has to do with the Pope. This has to do with the Catholic Church. Some will say this will have to do with Rome. Some say this has to do with the city of Jerusalem. Now, are we able to, to really definitively uh, say with great confidence exactly who? Uh, probably not. Uh, but we know that this idea of Babylon, which we'll get into, we see it in verse 5, represents a worldly system of religion. Now, Babylon, we can trace all the way back to Genesis chapter 11. It's kind of the, the seat of, of rebellion and those that oppose God. And that runs through the Old Testament and the New Testament. But is this the Catholic Church? Is it Rome? Is it Jerusalem? I don't know that the Bible gives us enough detail to make that uh, definitive uh, statement. But we know that Babylon represents, as it does throughout the Scripture, those who oppose the things of God, a rebellious people that oppose the things of God. So on your handout here, you see that uh, the book of Revelation is building two themes. We, we can see the, there's more, but at least these two themes. And one is the theme to continue to emphasize the triumph of Almighty God, that in the end, God will overpower the powers of darkness. In the end, God wins, Satan loses. That's a theme that is continuing to build throughout John's letter here as he sees these things unfolding the second thing we find here is God's grace and God's mercy to humanity. Uh, this is the theme that really jumped out uh, of, of the, the, the chapters to me in this study of Revelation. Is Sometimes when we think of Revelation, we think of all of the damnation and all of the, 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 you know, the, uh, the, the agony and, and all of the things that are happening between the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls, right? All of this judgment and wrath. Uh, but we find in the midst of all of that, God's grace in calling humanity to repent. And yet, many times, humanity will not repent. But that's a great theme. And these themes remind us, even those that were living in us today, that in the end, God wins. Now, we see in verse 5, if you want to just even jump to there in your Bibles there, verse 5, uh, because this is a theme and an important part to understand the 17th and 18th chapter, and really the rest of the book of Revelation. It says in verse 5, And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. Uh, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, we find that Babylon is used as a euphemism, a substitute a representation of the powers of darkness. Now, let me just give you a, a quick little history of that, uh, and it will help us as we focus here in chapter 17, the concept of Babylon. Now, we know that Babylon was a literal city in the Old Testament along the Euphrates River in Genesis chapter 11. We know that they tried to build a tower, the Tower of Babel, in this place called Babylon. And this became 
the first place that we find Babylon, and it became something that runs throughout, again, the Old and New Testament as a, a city, a nation, a people that opposed the things of God. So even in the book of Revelation, we're going to see in a minute, uh, in chapter 14 and chapter 16, John has already used Babylon in that type of figurative language. But, but Babylon, Babylon was a literal city. The second thing we find here is that the city is mentioned in the literal or figurative context 287 times in the Bible. We see it in the book of Psalms. We see it when, when Jeremiah is writing and, and, and the prophets are writing. We see it in Genesis it's mentioned 287 times. The only city mentioned more is Jerusalem. Over 800 times, Jerusalem is either uh, mentioned in its literal name, Jerusalem, or a figurative context. So the next city mentioned next to Jerusalem was Babylon. It's mentioned 287 times. It's very prevalent in the Bible. Later in the Old Testament, we know that Babylon became the capital city of the nation that cruelly conquered the Israelites. Remember, there's the Assyrians, the Babylonians, right? And we could even trace it all the way back further to, you know, the Egyptians, right? The Egyptians, you got the Assyrians, the Babylonians that God allowed to conquer his people. And again, the Babylonians were a people group in that day of the Old Testament that opposed the things of God, worshiped false deities, but they were, they were a people that God allowed to conquer Israel because of their unfaithfulness, in particular, the southern kingdom of Judah. But to the Jews, Babylon was always and really epitomized the sense of everything evil. That's how the Jews looked at the Babylonians and the place of Babylon. In the New Testament, the city and the people group that represented Babylon, in essence, was probably the Rome, was the Romans. You know, we may look at America today and say, well, what does epitomize, what, what area in America epitomize something that's very evil? We may think of a, a big city. We may think of, of uh, the city called Sin City, uh, Vegas, or we may think of L.A., or we may think of New York City or something of that nature. Uh, for, for the New Testament, for the people of God, Rome was that place. Rome was that place where evil took place, and the Romans, of course, who opposed the things of God, persecuted and martyred believers. So in John's day, uh, it was Rome. Now, does that mean that Babylon represents Rome here in chapter 17? It could, but we can't definitively say that. Uh, so here's a little concept of, of Babylon. It's a literal city. It's mentioned very uh, many times, 287 times in the Bible. And it is a people group and a nation, a, a place that God allowed to conquer the southern kingdom, and in the New Testament, Babylon was thought of as, again, the people that opposed God was thought of the Romans. So this great harlot represents the fall of religious Babylon. So chapter 17, we're going to break it into three sections, and because it's, it's kind of loaded with interpretation and, and struggles in that area, we're going to study it in three sections. And the first thing we find here is that John sees a woman. Uh, we're going to look at that. It's verses 1 through 6. So let's put our focus there. Let, let's start with verse 1. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come and I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. Uh, before we get into trying to attempt who and what this great harlot is representing, let us hear what the angel says to John clearly. I want to read it again. He, the angel says, Come and I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. Uh, I love this because John is, is privied into the information that the Bible is given to us from, from beginning to end. And that is, in the end, God wins. In the end, light conquers darkness. In the end, the people of God are, are going to be victorious. And, and John says, I want, before I tell you what she represents or try to figure that out or what I tell you her punishment or what I tell you she's going to do, I want you to know that she is already judged. I want you to know that there's no doubt, there's no question, there's no lingering thoughts, there's no debate, there's no wondering. 
she has already been judged. In other words, her future has already been told. She's going to fall. She's going to be destroyed. Now, I mentioned to you uh, a minute ago, uh, if you want to just kind of thumb through your Bible here and, and thumb a page back to chapter 14 and verse 8, we find, again, this reference of Babylon. I want you to see it uh, so you can really understand chapter 17. In chapter 14, verse 8, and another angel followed saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So John is getting this revelation that Babylon has fallen. Now remember, John is living in a day in which he's been banished to the island of Patmos. It seems like the wickedness of the world is winning and is stronger than the righteousness of the world and, and God's people. It seems like Rome is, is putting a death sentence upon the church. And John gets this revelation, Babylon, that, that, re, that rebellious religious people that oppose the things of God is fallen. It, it's, it's, again, we're told this in the scripture, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. It didn't say that the gates of hell wouldn't come against the church, but it said they won't prevail against the church. We see it in chapter 16 in verse 19. If you want to look at that verse, in chapter 16, verse 19, it says, now that great city was divided into the three parts and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of wine of the fierceness of his wrath. So again, John is being shown that Babylon, this great harlot, right, that's, that's uh, you know, kind of representing Babylon, is fallen. Uh, and so important for us to see that today in our world, even though it may feel like wickedness is winning, uh, Babylon has fallen. In the end, God wins. Now, the Bible refers to her as a woman, which seems to be of a great uh, mystery in our culture and day today. Uh, is the Bible talking about her in a, as a woman in the sense of a biological sex? Probably not. Probably a figurative analogy, much like he calls the church, the bride of Christ. It's, a, it's an analogy. It's a figurative analogy, right? And so here we find in a comparison, a contrast between the woman, the bride of Christ, and this woman. And in particular, if you were to go back to chapter 12 and verse 1, I believe it's on your handout even, it says, now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun <clears throat> and the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. Now, if you remember, we understood that woman to represent the idea of Mary, and the child in chapter 12 is certainly Christ, because the Bible says he'll rule with a rod of iron, the nations, and the offspring, in verse 17 of chapter 13, is the born-again believers. It's not only the Jewish people, but the born-again believers that have been grafted into the vine. So there's a comparison between the woman of chapter 12 and the woman of chapter 17. One woman represents light, one woman represents darkness. Uh, and we see this, <clears throat> this idea even fulfilled in the Old Testament with Jeremiah, chapter 3, verse 6. You can look that verse up at another time. It's talking about this idea of a people of God that opposed righteousness and it's represented as a woman. Again, just as the bride of Christ represented as a woman. Now, when it comes to this idea of Babylon, there, there's a little bit of history that I ran across that I thought was really interesting. It's in your handout here. It says, as a religious system... Babylon came into being long before Christianity. But in satanic imitation, it anticipated the coming of a true Messiah. According to religious history and a legend, the Babylonian religion was founded by the wife of Nimrod. And you've often said, if you don't like your name, your name could have been Nimrod. Nimrod was the great-grandson of Noah. And named Semiramis. Semiramis, she was a highly uh, thought of priest who was a woman, a priestess, if we could say that, of idol worship, and she gave birth to a son who claimed was conceived miraculously. The son's name was Talmuz. 
Tammuz was considered a savior in Babylonian mythology. Many ancient artifacts remain with the familiar motif of the mother Semiramis holding the savior infant Talmuz, which predate even Christianity. It was said that Talmuz was killed by a wild beast and then miraculously brought back to life. The idea of Tal, uh, uh, Talmuz in the Old Testament came also the idea of Baal. So the Bible doesn't use the word Talmuz, though it does in Exodus 8 and 14 when it says that women were weeping over Talmuz. It uses the idea of Talmuz gave birth and uh, offspring, blah, 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 and the, and the Greek gods and all that stuff, and became Baal. Uh, and so here we find this idea of Babylonian thought, who has a, 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 a theory, a myth on the idea of the flood as well, is the idea that there is a miraculous conception of birth, and there's this idea of uh, that child dying and coming back to life and being a savior, right? So we find comparisons of Christianity and other cultures that are rampant, that, that are, are very prevalent. Here we find in chapter 17, there's a woman. In chapter 12, there's a woman. And what does this woman do? The Bible says in verse one, she's sitting on many waters. Now remember, when we've seen this phrase earlier, back in chapter, I believe it was 13, where the Bible talks about this idea of many waters in, in chapter 12, it's not the idea of an ocean or a body of water. It's the idea of a body of people. So she's setting over or she has control over a great body of people. In other words, this woman is going to be an extraordinary political person and have great spiritual influence as she's governing a group of people. Now let's go to verse 2. With whom the kings of the earth committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So here's this great harlot, again, personified as a woman, just as the bride of Christ uh, personified as, as a, a woman and Christ being the groom. The Bible says she's committed fornication with kings of the earth. Now, these could be the same kings of chapter 16 and verse 12 that talked about many kings coming across the Euphrates River when it's dried up. But the, the idea is she's in political power and others that were in political power have now come under her umbrella. They have begun to do the deeds that she also does. There's this marriage. There's this alliance. And the Bible uses the idea of fornication here or some sort of union. We understand that this idea of a, some sort of sexual union, but there's this idea of, of a union that's personified here. And she is made drunk all of these that have come alongside and aligned with her with the wine of fornication. Uh, Karl Marx, who had a lot of different ideas, some that we might agree with and some that we probably wouldn't for sure, he, he said this, he said, religion is the opiate of the masses. Religion can be a narcotic. Sometimes people can start believing something and it doesn't matter what anyone else says or the Bible says, or anything else, they're so focused on it, right? And, and nothing can change their mind. It can be a drug that controls us and lead a man into spiritual stupor. And we find even in uh, Jeremiah 51 and 7, let me read you what Jeremiah said of this. And, and again, he's prophesying of his day and days to come, even our day today. Jeremiah 51 and verse 7, listen to how he words this. He says, Babylon, again, personified Babylon, figurative Babylon, not necessarily just the literal Babylon. He says, Babylon was a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunk. The nations drank her wine, therefore the nations are deranged. He goes on, Babylon has suddenly fallen and been destroyed. Wail for her, take balm for her pain, perhaps she can be healed. Uh, so here again, as I mentioned, the Old Testament personifies Babylon literal and figuratively. And here he says that she's been drunk. Babylon has been like a religion that's caused people to be drunk and deranged. Now, we would understand that any, any religion 
any denomination, any church, any doctrine, any belief that doesn't believe Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation and went to the cross and by his blood we have been redeemed. Anything that differs from that, right, is a religious spirit. There's some that believe that, you know, we get to God by doing good deeds and we're good people, right? You'd be amazed. I know you've had the conversations as I had with people when it comes to the idea of God and they, they believe in some sort of higher power. Well, how do you get to that higher power? Well, you need to be a good person. Well, you gotta be more than a good person. You gotta be a saved person. You, you gotta have Jesus in your heart. And the only way that happens is you forgive, ask him to forgive you of your sins. And, and so uh, here we find this religious spirit, this, this system of religion, right, that people put their trust in. Uh, anything else than Jesus Christ it's not going to do any good. Verse 3. So he carried me away. Now, who's the he? Probably the angel of verse number 1. We know it can't be the spirit for two reasons. Even though the Bible tells us the Holy Spirit is personified as a he in John's gospel. Number one, uh, he is not capitalized, the personal pronoun. So we know it's not deity. And the second part is he carried me away in the spirit. <laughs> the spirit's involved already uh, in this. So the he is probably the angel. And he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. Isn't it interesting how many times the spirit of the Lord will carry people into the wilderness to get their attention? Where was Moses when God spoke to him and had this great epiphany in the wilderness? Where was Jesus, right, when, when the enemy tempted him, but then the Bible says angels came and ministered to him in the wilderness, right? Where was Philip picked up and carried from the wilderness in the book of Acts? Uh, we find God reveals himself in the wilderness. All the names that we call God, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Tiskanu, Jehovah Jireh, where were all those learned by the Israelites? In the wilderness, wandering around for 40 years. And so there's something powerful about the wilderness and when God speaks to us. So he carries him away into the wilderness and he says, I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So John sees this woman on a scarlet beast. Now, uh, I'll mention a couple things here about the color of this beast that I think is important. It's the same color of the beast or the dragon in chapter 13. The Bible says that the dragon was red. Here we find this idea of scarlet. Even the color of sin, though your sin be as scarlet, he will make them white as snow. Here we find that the beast is aligned with this idea of sin and this idea of, of carrying out unrighteousness. Uh, I like what John Walford says here. It's on the top of page three there. It says, her position, that of riding the beast, indicates on the one hand that she is supported by a political power of the beast. On the other hand, that she is a dominant role and at least the outwardly controls and directs the beast uh, this woman her agenda has been carried by the beast what is she writing she's writing on this beast in other words the beast is carrying out her agenda and the beast we understand of course satan carrying out her agenda and, and just like god god uses people to carry out his agenda here satan is using this great harlot to carry out his agenda, Satan's agenda. Now again, the idea of harlot we find in the Old Testament is the idea of, of unfaithfulness, right? The idea, idea of, of, of sexual lewdness. Uh, but it's the idea also of, in the spiritual realm, of spiritual adultery, right? And the Bible uses those terms when it's talking about this kind of thing. We'll see more of that in just a moment. Now the Bible says here in verse 3, right, that the scarlet beast was full of names of blasphemy, this is the work of the enemy, right? He's always putting names of blasphemy. And the beast has seven heads and ten horns. Well, we've studied this out and seen this in our study of Revelation in chapter 12 and chapter 13. The seven heads represent seven empires, right? Seven empires and, that have persecuted the people of God. Well, uh, those that believe uh, the, the scripture here and Revelation as a realist they understand that there's already been six empires that have persecuted the people of God. Egypt, one, 
Syria, two. Babylon, three. Persians, four. Greece and the Romans. In other words, there's coming yet another empire that's going to greatly persecute the people of God. And I believe that's the empire that Revelation is talking about. Now, what makes up that empire is the ten horns. The ten horns represent ten nations forming one empire, a collectiveness. The idea of other nations, isn't this what the Bible says? Kings will come and join in with making fornication with her and being drunk with wine. What are these other kings? They're a part of these other ten areas, nations, that will make up what many people believe, the old remnants of the Roman Empire. Uh, let's go to verse 4. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet. Again, scarlet, the idea of though your sin be as scarlet, the idea of red, the dragon red, right, color of the beast, uh, this idea of sinfulness. But there's another meaning to it in, in just a minute. And adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations, and the filthiness of her fornication. She's referred to as the great harlot, but she's dressed. <laughs> she's dressed at not just some sort of harlot or prostitute that we may think of on the streets. She has scarlet and purple. Both were colors representing splendor and magnificence, uh, magnificence. Uh, the dyes of scarlet and purple uh, to produce these colors were very costly. So the colors themselves represented royalty and splendor. Uh, we find, I like what Barnhouse says here, we find in the course of the church history that one of the deadliest marks of ecclesiastical corruption is the lust for temporal power. So here she is. She has given herself to the enemy, to Satan, to carry out his agenda and she's been corrupted by power and the lust of pride. And scarlet also represents the idea of bloodshed. Uh, we find that in, in uh, chapter 6 and verse 9, which I think I have in our handout to read here in just a moment, that talks about the blood of the martyrs before the Lord. How long, right, before redemption and vengeance they're crying out. And the Bible says here in verse 4 that there's a golden cup. A golden cup that's full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. Now, the golden cup in her hand is an illusion, right? One would think such a beautiful, decorated, costly cup meant that there was something good inside. Remember what Jesus told the, the Jews and the Pharisees when it came to all these uh, ceremonial washings? He, he says, you know, take this cup. He says this in Matthew 23. He says, take this cup. You clean the outside of the cup, but it's the inside of the cup that's dirty, right? And he's, he's metaphorically saying, on the outside, you walk around like you're clean, but it's the inside, your heart, that's corrupt, that needs cleansing, right? So this golden cup has this idea of what's in it must be good because the outward decoration of it and costliness of it seems good but the bible says it's full of abominations and filthiness and fornication all of that verse five and on the, her forehead a name was written here's the name mystery babylon the great the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth uh, the mystery separates babylon from being literal in this context He's not talking about literal Babylon, the, the nation, the city of the Babylonians. He's saying it's a mystery. He's saying it's the figurative Babylon that he's talking about. And there should be no reason for deception because her name is right there. The mother of harlots. Isn't it amazing how so many people can be deceived, though it's so plain through the scripture, what's happening in our world? So many people be deceived. It's like Saul, before his name was Paul, right? The Bible says it was like scales that came off of his eyes. This spiritual awakening to see. And here, she has a name, she's carrying out an agenda, and yet so many will be deceived, even though she is called the mother of harlots. Now, what's also interesting about this is, I did a little bit of research, and there's, there's some 
research out there that suggests that one of the things that Roman prostitutes did is they wore a headband around their head and on the front of that headband was her, her name. I don't know exactly why they, they did that, but history tells us that it was very common for a prostitute in that day and time to wear a headband with her name on it. Um, maybe it was for someone to call them by name. Maybe it was to, to somehow mark some sort of the idea of, of this person was, was involved in prostitution. But here the Bible says that the, the name is on the forehead. The Romans in that culture would have picked that right up. That, oh, the prostitutes put their name on their forehead. Here, figuratively, one that is unfaithful to God, Babylon, who opposes the things of God, also she has a name on her forehead, and her name is the mother of harlots. It also should be pointed out that, that God, from uh, the book of Revelation, we can see that God has marked or put a seal or put, put his name upon the foreheads of his people. We see that in, in the book of Revelation, chapter 7 and verse 3, that he's put his name on them. Well, what does the enemy want to do? He wants to put his name, his mark, upon those that are unrighteous. We see that in chapter 14. We see that in chapter 13, where, where you take a mark, this idea of a seal, a mark, an identification, right? And so here we find this harlot has... Her identity revealed. She's the mother of all harlots, just as a Roman prostitute would write her name on her head. Here, her name is on her head. There should be no reason for deception except that man is intoxicated and has no ability to make a spiritual judgment. Intoxicated with all of this religiousness. Now we get to verse 6. And John says, I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. The state of being drunk here, as it says in verse 6, is not a temporary term in its meaning. It's a continuous state of mind. Just as the Bible says, be filled with the Spirit, don't be drunk with wine, be filled with the Spirit. It's saying, don't be continually intoxicated with the things of the world, but continually be filled with the Spirit of God. That's what that verse is saying. Here it's the same emphasis. This idea of drunk is not the idea of temporary coming to be sober. It's a continuous state of drunkenness. The woman was a continuous state of drunkenness. And what is the consumption that makes her drunk? It's the blood of the saints. Again, you can go back to chapter 6 and verse 9 as the martyrs are before God, before the altar saying, O oh Lord, how long until justice is served? And the Lord says, wait just yet a little bit longer. So she's just dr drunk with the blood of the saints. And this, is, this has been the idea of, of Satan's agenda from the very beginning right? He, he, the thief comes except to steal, to kill, and destroy. That's the enemy's agenda, John 10 and 10. Here we find that <clears throat> the enemy's agenda is carried out by this woman, this, this group, this empire, this nation that's been drunk with the things of religion, and they carry out the martyrs of the saints. It says, and with me the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when John sees this, he is amazed to quote john walford again on the bottom of page three that last line it says false religion is always the worst enemy of true religion when you think about the people that jesus won the people that jesus revealed himself to in fact there were times when jesus avoided the jewish people and the pharisees and the sadducees and and all the other religious sects of the day, because they refused him. They would not allow their eyes to be open. So Jesus went to those that were oppressed and those that had physical maladies and those who had spiritual possessions and oppressions. And we read about the miracles of Jesus. When you, when you really think about it and read about them, the miracles of Jesus are those that didn't have a religious spirit. They were the lepers and the Samaritans. 
Uh, they were the Galileans who didn't align with Jewish thought. They, they were the oppressed and depressed and they were the desperate. Uh, they were those that allowed the Lord to open their eyes. But the Pharisees and the, the other Jewish sects of the day, they refused Jesus even though they seen all of his miracles. Right? John stands amazed at this. I ran across this uh, uh, little thought about uh, the Bloody Mary, right? Because uh, we all probably know what a Bloody Mary is. Uh, and I ran across this and I thought I'd, I'd throw it in here. It says, we should, I'm on page four, we should never forget that some of the most vicious persecution conducted against true Christians has been done in the name of the church. In the days when the Roman Catholic Queen Mary ruled England, known as Bloody Mary, some 288 Christians were burnt at the stake for their stand for Christian truth between 1555 and 1558. The first of these martyrs was a man named John Rogers, who, as he stood chained to a stake and the fire arose around him, up to his legs and shoulders, he rubbed his hands in the flames as if he were washing his hands in cold water and lifted his hands to the heavens and held them high until he was completely consumed by fire. Rogers went to the stake with such calm and dignity that the French ambassador wrote that he went to his death as if he was walking to his wedding. His courage was so evident that the huge crowd burst into an applause when they saw him walking to the stake. Uh, I don't know how much history you know about uh, the Queen Mary that ruled England, that known as Bloody Mary, but she wanted to get rid of Christians that believed, again, in the, Jesus Christ is the only way, truth, and life. And she did so by perhaps the most cruel way possible, burning them alive. And, and martyrs, I, I think I told you this a couple weeks ago that that in the last, uh, the, the last century, right, that there have been more individuals martyred, right, in the, in the last century than there were all the way from the beginning. Now, we don't see that in America, right? It's happening in third world countries, but it's still happening today. People giving their lives for the sake of the gospel. And John talks about these martyrs. And when he sees all of this happening, he is amazed. So here's verses one through six. Figurative Babylon. It accomplishes two things. To oppress and persecute God's people and to promote and propagate false religion. Now next week we're going to look at verses seven through 14 and we're going to get the explanation John receives of what's going to happen to this woman. Right? But here I want you to see in verses one through six that ba Babylon represents a group of people that are rebellious and opposed to things of God. And she has upon her name, she's been labeled, she's riding upon a beast. That beast is carrying out the agenda, right, of this woman whom he's using. And she has been unfaithful, right, to her creator and maker. All of this is happening. The, the, the seven heads, again, represent those seven empires. The ten horns represents a nation that's going to come together and persecute God's people. The end, right, will be martyrs. Uh, will be martyrs. So next week we'll talk about chapter seven, verses 7 through 14. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity to share your word. Thank you for the opportunity to study it, oh God. Lord, I pray that uh, what we've heard today and what we've seen in your word today has brought a, a, a sharpness to our heart. And Father, uh, maybe... Uh, a reality that we did not yet have to what's going to happen. Father, we thank you that in the end, just as we've seen in verse one, in the end, you will win and we, your people, will be victorious. Father, help us to have that kind of faith and that kind of mindset, even in the world in which we live in today. Bring us back together the next appointed time. In Jesus' name, we ask and pray, amen. God bless you this morning.